All right, so we are in our short series, Why We Worship, and as we kind of lean in on this, one of the things we talked about last week was kind of why. Why do we, why do we worship? And really, the, the reality of it is, is because we are put before God in Jesus Christ. We actually get to stand right before God, and the response to God when you're face-to-face has always been, will always be in all eternity, worship. Today, we are going to kind of look at worship from a different angle. Um, you know, a lot of times people, it's ironic, Jared, that you read a poem. I didn't know you were going to do that because the opening slide's kind of funny. Um, nope, there you go. It's called Why We Need Poetry. Imagine this. Your eyes are like eyes and your lips are, well, they're like lips. How magical is that? Does that not communicate love? Like when you say your eyes are like sapphires, gleaming with the light of a thousand suns. You know, you get all, uh, poetry pulls out emotion out of us and we create imagery that maybe isn't there. And I know this, having lived in Hawaii for a year, there are, um, if you saw Moana, you'll notice there's a lot of pagan references and different things that go on and they talk about creation as though creation is the God. And you hear that. And in Christian worship, sometimes you have that. You can find yourself you know, kind of dealing with fire and oceans and deserts and all these things, right? And you're going, what is going on? Are we talking about the earth or are we talking about God? But there's metaphors in this and we live and breathe in metaphors quite often. Um, We use imagery all the time to express how we feel about a situation. Here's a good example. If you go to an NBA game or a college game and it's, and the guy, there's a guy out there. Remember back in the day with Chauncey Billups, Mr. Big Shot, it was so fun. And that guy could just drain him, right? And he'd be shooting and you'd hear the announcers go, Billups is on fire. And you're like, yeah, yeah. You know, and you get all excited. Anybody else? God, you people are the worst. And thank you too. <laughs> Both on the praise team. Come on, work it out with me. Somebody has a pitching arm in here. All right. So you'd hear this news like Chauncey Billups is on fire. How thankful are we that he's not running around? Ah, 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 I'm on fire. He's not on fire. It's a metaphor right? You say he's on fire, but for the women, children, and everybody else involved, we're thankful he wasn't. But it paints a picture. It says, this guy's got a hot hand right now. He's playing well. There's, um, there's these different things uh, that go on. I think of Alicia Keys. She's on fire, right? Yeah, there it is. Brian's going to sing it. Um, when she sings, this girl's on fire, you're very thankful in the studio she wasn't set alight. But you get the imagery going on. So let's do this. Remember back in high school for me, you know, we'll, we'll use this. You're in high school. You, you're, you're going to hang out with some friends. You're all hanging out at their place, their parents' place. It's not your place. And um, you go there and you're hanging out and suddenly your ex-girlfriend walks in And you're there trying to, you know, kind of make your move on on this new girl that you like. She's a sophomore, you're a senior, and her dad says no. And um, and so you're trying to make these moves. Your girlfriend, your ex-girlfriend walks in, and somebody, it gets real awkward. You can just cut the tension with a knife, and people are like, whoa. Nobody talks about the issue, but there's a what in the room? An elephant. How thankful are we that there's not Mr. Trunks a lot trampling around in your great room, just swatting kids around and stepping on them with his heavy gray pads? There's not an elephant in the room, but it paints a picture for us. You know, you do a project for some, with some friends in college, and you're all doing a project, and they get tired on Friday, go home to ramen and a cheap mattress while you stay and you work in the lab, and they left you high end. Right, so we get this. We understand that quite often we'll use a metaphor to explain a reality. We deal with fire, oceans, deserts. Oh my, what are we talking about when we do this in worship? Well, I think one of the things is that there's always been a creative narrative because God, who formed all creation, um, gives us this imagery. So we're gonna read from Matthew chapter uh, 14, verse 22 to 33. It's the story of uh, Jesus walking on the water. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them 
walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. The Greek word for this, it's a ghost, is phantasma. Oh, isn't that cool? Where we get phantom. Anywho, I thought that was fun Greek. Um, They said, they screamed, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately says to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. I want to say something. That is the wrong translation for it is I. The actual translation in this is I am he. Jesus is making a God declaration here. And it's important that we always remember this. When Jesus says, I am, and Moses, we go back to the Old Testament, we say, when Moses said, who do I say sent me? What'd God say? Tell them, I am that I am. So when Jesus says, I am he, he who you know, don't be afraid, he's making a God claim. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you out on the water. Come, Jesus says. Then Peter, over the gun wall he goes, out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. Can you imagine those first few steps? This is so amazing, you're a sucker, John. You know, like teasing the other apostles. Because there's always competition there. We like to see them holy and good, but they were competitive. You know, what's the matter, Andrew, the coward? You know, and Peter's walking. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. I just think that's funny. Who here's seen the wind? It means Peter got his eyes off the topic. He was afraid and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. To which Andrew said, better swim, Peter. You know, you can just hear this going on. Immediately, Jesus reached down, took out his hand and caught him and said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, Truly, you are the son of God. There's this moment that goes on in scripture that um, tells us this. When we're trying to walk on the waves of life, when we're out in the great unknown, we need to recognize that there is a reality that goes out into our lives. Rachel, if you could jump to that next slide. The, The reality of trying to walk on the waves is when we as the people of God are stepping out towards Jesus in a place that is fearful. In the Old Testament and in this time, water was known as chaos. And chaos is where the great monsters of the deep were and they came out at night. In the darkness, in the chaos of the waters was very terrifying to the people of the ancient world. So what they, what they understood is getting out of the boat is terrifying. It was scary enough being in it. And Peter gets out and walks to him. And there's this, this reality in a, in a song we're going to look at today. And it's a song called Oceans. Because you could think we were worshiping the old lady Pacific. You know, we, we're worshiping that. No, we're talking about a God who calls us out into the chaos of this world and doesn't allow us the freedom or opportunity to not obey him to go into the unknown to go out into the unknown. The song says, you call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail. Do you see the scriptural reference in that? Peter's feet failed. And there I find you in the mystery, in these deep oceans, my faith will stand. In these places of chaos, my faith will stand. In these places of unknown and fear, my my feet, my faith will stand. But with Peter, the story seems a little bit different, doesn't it? See, we look at this and we can wonder what was going on because Peter called out, Lord, if that's you, call me to you. And Jesus was like, come on. Over he goes and he walks out until what? Until Peter took his eyes off the Lord, Peter was not subservient to the created order. Peter had his eyes on Jesus and walked on the chaotic waters of life. He stood above wind and wave and storm and gale and walked towards it, which means that creation still bends its knee to its creator. And Peter walking out towards Jesus was an amazing story until when? until Peter looks at the wind, which I think is amazing. He looks at the wind. I wonder if the first thing was, it was like a big gust came through and he thought, whoa, that was a big gust. 
man, I'm, I'm going to sink. And just a feeling hit him. And he began to worry. And all of a sudden, he notices his robes are heavy. And he's like, I never took swimming. And he starts panicking. Robes are getting heavy. And down Peter goes. And he reaches out for Jesus. Peter couldn't do it on his own. And the interesting thing is, right in front of him stood the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet Peter couldn't do it. Jesus was still right there. But Peter couldn't keep his eyes off the wind and the waves, which tells me this, that this water, this water that Peter was walking on is a metaphor for the chaos of our lives that we will live in. And we have to keep our eyes in front on Jesus. But the hard thing is, even with Jesus right there, Peter began to sink. And you think, okay, did Jesus have a fix for that? Because that bothers me. That Jesus being right in front of me isn't enough. Indeed, Jesus does have the proverbial fix for what Peter was missing. For the very thing Peter missed, which was the dwelling of the Holy Spirit within him. Peter had Jesus right in front of him, yet he couldn't get over the elements around him. What he needed was God to move in. In John chapter 16, Jesus makes a promise to his disciples and he says, all of this I have told you so that you will not fall away, so that you won't sink. And I've told you all this for that reason. They will, the religious leaders and anyone opposing Christianity, will put you out of the synagogue, kick you out of community. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. And I've told you this so that when their time comes, when you're in chaos, when the waters swirl, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Jesus is saying, I'm going to be ascended. I'm going to leave this earth. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, it's a Greek term, the paraclete, the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him. I will send him. And in some remarkable, beautiful way, the sending of the Holy Spirit takes us from sinking to preaching. There's two different Peters that happen in the Bible. There is Peter before Pentecost and Peter after Pentecost. There's the Peter who had Jesus in front of him but couldn't shake the temptations, the fears, and the draw of the world. And then there's Peter the day that the wind shook the building. There's Peter on the day when Jesus said it would come. See, this is what happened. Jesus told his disciples, don't leave Jerusalem. Wait there until the Spirit comes, until you receive power from on high. That's what he says. And it says this in Acts chapter two, that the disciples were all gathered in one room. They were sitting there, gathered in the room, and the sound like a mighty rushing wind came running through the house. House is a term for temple. They were in the temple. Think about this. Peter had his eyes on what? The wind. All of a sudden, Peter sees the wind and it fills his life. The spirit of God comes rushing into the life of those who confess Christ. Tongues of fire drop down out of heaven. And these Regular, everyday, ordinary tax collectors, fishermen, prostitutes, and the rest start declaring the wonders of God like they've been hung up on Rosetta Stone for months. They start speaking in the language of the Cretans, the Phoenicians, the Arabs. And everybody goes, aren't these just Galileans? How are they declaring the wonders of God in our midst? And Peter stands up in the chaos of the rushing wind. And he says, men of Jerusalem and of Israel, listen to me. These are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. They're not drunk. But this is the fulfillment of what the prophet Joel said. 
In the last days, I will pour out my spirit. Your young men will dream dreams. Your old men will speak prophecies. And he begins to unfold the sermon on Pentecost. This Peter who sunk with Jesus in front of him had the wind of God blow through him and suddenly the wind of God is activating the elements once again. And Peter gives a sermon that is so awesome. He stands under the shadow of the Antonian fortress where the Roman garrison would have said, and he said to the people of Jerusalem, this is Peter who denied Jesus just about 50 days prior. This is the same Peter said, you, you people, you crucified, you handed Jesus over to evil men. Who picks a fight with a Roman legion unless it's somebody filled with the spirit of God who knows that unless he confronts what's going on in the world, people will never turn to God. And Peter knows worship must come out of the people of God. They must meet Jesus Christ. They must meet Jesus the disciples were frightened and terrified, waiting for Jesus to do what he promised. Send them the advocate, the spirit of God, the one who would reveal Christ. The thing that was better than having Jesus in front of them was having the spirit of God within them. The wind of God blew through the life of Peter. 3,000 people were cut to the heart and they said, what do we do? We're dying here, Peter, help us out. And he said, repent and be baptized. And they did. And they were taken down to the place of ceremonial washing. And they were, um, and they were completely transformed and um, brought to life in Christ Jesus. What we understand in this moment is that Peter is filled with the Spirit of God. Peter is not captive to the elements anymore. Something's different with Peter. Peter. Something changed, and it wasn't just his outward appearance or his speakability or his sense of confidence in the moment. It was the Spirit of God, and it goes well with the song, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. We love borders in our life. We love safety places, right? Places of safety. We fight for security, and we want to find a way to tighten our borders, secure them, and make sure we're safe. But the spirit of God, we cry out, lead me where our trust is without borders. Let me walk out again, God, out onto the chaos, out onto the waters, wherever you would call me, wherever Jesus would say, come. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. Take me to a place I don't deserve to go and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Is Jesus standing in front of Peter anymore in what we're talking about? No, but his spirit fills him. And Peter knows that the presence of Christ living within him is a transformative agent. He becomes the very hand and feet of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was right with Peter, he couldn't keep his eyes on him. But when the spirit filled him, he couldn't keep his eyes off of Jesus when the Spirit of God filled him. And this is why I think it's critical that we as a church understand that in the end, we are profoundly evangelical and profoundly Spirit-filled because we know religion hurts, but Spirit-filled Christianity is as winsome and attractive as a donut to a starving person. They just want to bite. They just want to be close. And people often ask, why is the church in decline? Because we've held on to our traditions and our rules far tighter than we've held on to the Spirit of God. We have done things that grieve the Spirit of God. And we have, in order that we, we may do what our tradition demands. Our tradition can be pushed away when we understand we're doing what Christ calls us to. Our lives begin to reveal him in wonderfully attractive ways. Peter lives this out. No matter the danger of being a disciple, Peter continues living faithfully. The fear and isolation was waiting for him. After Jesus ascended, there was a fear like Peter and the disciples, like, what do we do? They waited 10 long days. You make me wait too long in a fast food line, I'll lose my mind. How long will we wait for Jesus to come into our storm, into our chaos and do what he promised? The disciples waited 10 lonely days in a city where Jesus Christ's blood still stained the, the ground. They were frightened. They were overwhelmed and it was chaotic. But they obeyed Jesus Christ. And we see 
It starts with the water and Peter walking out onto it. And we remember there's a promise from Jesus in John 16. And now we see the fulfillment of Pentecost coming to the church, the spirit of God indwelling. And we begin to ask the question, why do we worship? And I believe it's because we worship because it recognizes God's sovereignty. Worship recognizes God's sovereignty. I'm not texting in church. I'm opening a note from a friend who texted me yesterday because there was a time when the foundry was on its last breath and God sent a dream to a friend of mine. So funny. Um, Yesterday, I'm not a big crier. I don't know why. I'm just not good at crying. It could be because I cried a lot as a kid and I got called mean names. Um, (laughs) But uh, I, I don't cry a lot. Yesterday, I was in Mr. Kozak's, awesome, and I know, right? I still don't come close. Um, I still smell a little garlicky. But um, we were getting some of the, the gyro meat for an appetizer thing we were doing for a family party, and I asked my friend, I'd said, could you, could you send me that dream you told me about? It's gotten foggy in my mind. Could you send it? So he sends it. I'm sitting in Mr. Kozak's, and I start reading the text, and I'm like this... And I'm like, what is going on? I was like, I don't know. I'm crying near Euros and it's weird. And I got, so I literally, I walk out. Eric is in the car. I walk out and just kind of lay my head on the, on the windowsill of the car. And I just blubbered there for a minute. I'm like, I'm fine. It's fine. But here's why. Because everything seems so good and stable now. But there was a night I'll do my best to describe it in text. It was after an empty Saturday night service in the gym. 21 people were there. Anywho. (laughs) It was a very clear dream of us, the foundry, walking through a tunnel, I guess you could call it, only it was 100% clear, the whole thing. You could see everything outside the glass on every side. Our, Our side of the tunnel was pure or outside of the tunnel was pure chaos, mostly like water, waves, and storms flying by. Meanwhile, perfect silence inside the tunnel, pure, perfect silence. The tunnel started out very small, but the longer we walked the tu- in being faithful, the tunnel got wider. That obviously made it easier for all of us to get where we, we thought we needed to go. I do not remember seeing God at the end of it or even seeing anything at the end, but... There was never any doubt what was waiting. I love that. The works, uh, the world was crashing all around us and all we had to do was to be faithful in the direction we were called to walk. The storms didn't stop outside of the tunnel, but none of us ever got wet. Aside from hearing God's voice on the way home from a mission trip in Kalkaska, this is the clearest picture I've seen in my life. I hope it makes sense. As a victim of that night, I remember when there was 21 people and 16 of them were signed up to volunteer or family. And I thought, God, what are we doing? I've made a mistake. I can't do this anymore. I wanted to run away screaming. And God just said, next step, the next step, the next step. Have you ever been in chaos? Chaos so big and so terrifying that it was like a storm was raging around you and you didn't know what to do. So you just followed Jesus as best you could and you put your head down and you took the next step. Knowing that there is in our Bible a God bigger than the storm, but you can't feel him. You can't see him. The grief is too dark. The fear is too too heavy and you can only take a baby step ahead and go, oh God, Meet me here, please. And you walk ahead. There's no more beautiful image of the worshiping church than the church under a heavy blanket of reality, under pain and distress, taking the next faithful step against circumstances, trusting in the sovereignty of God. Why do we worship? We worship because he remains Lord in spite of our circumstances, amen? We worship because he is still Lord, God on the throne in spite of our circumstances. Amen? I don't know about you, but I need that to be true. I need that to be true. I need God 
bigger than my circumstances. I want him bigger than my circumstances. I want the mountains to tilt their head in sovereign recognition of their Lord. I want the oceans to tremor when his breath moves across it. I want the galaxies to continue exploding out, not because it gives me confidence, but because it reminds me that the God of this universe knows my name and yours. And that alone is worth turning my heart and worship. We've got to be people who understand why we worship. And we do it because we recognize in worshiping God's sovereignty over us, over our circumstances, over our success and our failure. We end up holding out, not our worship to God, but our arms so he can scoop us up and show us his plan for this world. And maybe give us enough courage for another obedient step. So I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When the oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours and you are mine. The chaos will come. The oceans will rage. The world will shake and tremor under the weight of sin. But its creator still speaks. And he does so quite often in the worship of his people gathered and alone, lifting him up above their circumstances in worship. Our calling is great and high. It's to join the chorus of the galaxies, the oceans, the earth, the wind, the fire, and join in in the beautiful chorus of who he is, the almighty creator, sustainer of all life, all things, for the glory of Jesus Christ. The other reason we worship is because worship can testify through the storms of your own life, and it does. Anybody... Anybody can get looked at for success, but the storms of our life reveals character. It strips away all the comfort and all the good, and all you have left is this bare little thread of who you are until that thread is filled with the Holy Spirit. And that little piece of who is left after everything is stripped away is that one thing that God will rebuild the life out of that he will breathe his breath into and reanimate all that was lost and all that was broken. We worship God to testify of God's faithfulness even in the storms of our life. If you haven't gone through storms, you will. If you're in a storm, it doesn't last forever. If you need God to be high and lifted up in your life and you're in a storm, you're in the perfect position to let the world see that your circumstances do not define your faith, your savior, or your God. And finally, worship is an expression of faith. It is an expression of Hebrews chapter 11 that faith is being certain of what we hope for. No, I quoted it wrong. I just turned it around in my head. Somebody help me in this room. Faith. Now faith is being confident in what we hope for and certain of what we do not yet see. Faith is being confident of what we hope for. What do you hope for beyond the storms of your life? Now be confident in the vision God gave you even if you don't yet see it. Because you, the children of God, the people of God, the gathered body of Christ are called to do one thing, to worship in spite of your lives, to worship in spite of your circumstances, to worship because he is God, because he is worthy, and because one day all storms will come to an end. All, all pain, all chaos, all hurt will come to an end. It'll bow the knee to Jesus Christ, and what will be left standing is the worshiping church of Jesus Christ, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. May that be our refrain until that glorious day when the heavens split and worship takes on a new note. But until then, may we be the chorus. May we be the chorus gathered around the instruments of this world, the wind, the waves, and whatever, and join in the worship of Almighty God. Why? Because he is worthy. Because he is God, and those storms are not bigger than him. Lord Jesus Christ, today we ask for a special measure of grace for the grace to hold on and hope for the vision you gave us for our life. For the grace to grab on 
when it seems like all is lost, yet God, you remain speaking a word of hope. When we, like Peter, sink in the storms of life, when we were once so sure of our faith and we were once so willing to go out into the world and do whatever you ask, Lord, today we confess we're sinking in many places, in many ways, for many reasons. Our eyes are on the wind, so we ask, come Holy Spirit, blow through this room, shake the roof and the walls, and turn your church loose in confident worship. Worship of a spirit-filled community that knows our witness is born out of our faithfulness to Jesus by the power of his spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Your church gathers in earnest expectation that you are not done speaking into the storms and the chaos of this life and this world. Lord Jesus, to you and you only do we lift our praise and our worship. The God who is worthy, the God who is able, and the God who has redeemed everything in his name. Amen. Let's worship together. Please stand.